Okay, so what I'm going to talk about uh, is not fully to the topic because uh, I figure I'd take a, a couple of weeks to talk about that topic in detail. I'm going to first of all have a few comments on what is an extreme hurricane uh, based on some research we did uh, in the last, um, last year or so. And then I'm going to focus most of my attention on hurricane intensity and how that varies with climate, uh, both climate change and climate variability. If I start with, the, uh, with what is an extreme hurricane, um, this is an index that we developed for the uh, Willis Research Network. Uh, it's, it's not based on a whole lot of data, but it illustrates a point I want to make. Uh, what it does is it provides an assessment of the damage in actual dollars to, um, to the offshore oil facilities. And those of you who don't know what it looks like, these are all individual facilities in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, it does that by taking account of, uh, of the maximum winds cubed, uh, the ra radius of hurricane force winds with no power to it, and the translational speed to the inverse power of two. Uh, this only applies to hurricanes, and uh, it only applies for storms above a certain uh, minimum speed. Uh, the overall index itself explains more than 90% of the variance based on dependent data. We're, uh, we're waiting to uh, get some independent data before we actually go ahead and publish this. But the point I want to take here is let's just examine how these three terms contribute to damage of uh, offshore facilities. The top one here is uh, intensity in, uh, in, in knots. This is all in knots and nautical miles to be consistent with, uh, with forecast uh, activity. This one here is the, um, the radius of hurricane force winds, and this one is the translational speed. And you can see that uh, in, in order of importance, the intensity is the least important. It only explains about 20 odd percent of the variance. The, the size explains around 50%, and the translational speed explains uh, something like 70% of the variance. You need to look at it a little bit more detail and just simply those numbers, because let's just look at the numbers here. Um, if we take this one out, then this number goes up quite markedly. But then again, if I take this number out, this number goes to zero. So there's a fair bit of, uh, of, of sort of ambiguity about how uh, intensity works in, in this situation. But I'm just going to say that sounds like a reasonable number. Uh, there's not so much sensitivity here. I can take it any two or three points, and uh, one or two or three, perhaps even three points, and I still get a pretty well a similar result, and the same over here. So these are robust results. Now, if I actually do a, a linear regression, multiple linear regression type approach, um, uh, I obviously pick this one first, and then I add this one in, and by the time I've done those two, there's about 1% of the variance explained by intensity. So as far as oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico is concerned, it doesn't matter a damn what it is, provided it's hurricane force or a bit higher. Uh, it's actually how big it is and how long it's around. We're extending this off to, um, uh, to coastal regions at present, and I'll, uh, I'll talk on this at some future time. But I just have to say that just a sort of a fairly cursory look through the, uh, the impacts of coast. Well, now, firstly, it's a lot more difficult for coastal regions because if you've got a town like New Orleans, it sort of matters where the hurricane landfalls relative to that. So there's a, there's a lot of other difficulties kick in. But just uh, looking at recent history, uh, it's actually size and translation speed that has been far more important than intensity. And pretty well all of the damage we've had of any consequence, uh, aside from the odd small one like Charlie, has been due to the, uh, to the structure and the, uh, and, the intensi and, the, and the translational speed of the storm. So all I'm asking is, I think we should perhaps reconsider what, we, what constitutes an extreme hurricane. And in this regard, I think we really do need to start looking at how models produce, predict um, uh, size and, and other things. Uh, translational speed's inherent in, um, in, the, in the track, but I'd like to see that being looked at explicitly. And if we start looking at these other terms, I think we might start to find some improvements there. So the rest of the talk is on intense hurricanes and climate, variability and change. And here I'm going to uh, start off with a couple of recent publications. Firstly, the, uh, the CCSP syn um, synthesis of SAP. This is a report by the Climate Change Science Program. This is the uh, recent paper that uh, has just come out by Knudsen et al. with myself and others as co-authors. And basically, they're reasonably consistent in the, in the two bits I want to uh, refer to. Maximum intensity will increase by somewhere around uh, one to eight percent, or um, uh, which which equates to a couple two to two to ten meters a second, say, or eleven meters a second. Rainfall rate will increase also, and indeed everything I'm going to present from here on in 
even though I'm doing it specifically for hurricane intensity, applies to any extreme value in the atmosphere, and that's what the study's about. It's about general extreme values. Um, the point here is that neither of these terms can be quantified by the current observing system. So if we're actually going to go look for this, you can't find it because it ain't possible. Yet, if you take uh, a paper that's literally just come out by um, uh, Bender et al., uh, actually a couple of months ago, um, uh, which then has been referred to in the Newton et al. paper, Cat 4 5 hurricanes may increase by up to 80% in, uh, in future climate over the next 60 to 70 years. And this is from a, uh, a part of this other overall study that, uh, that I've produced. And what I've shown here is going back to 1940 and coming forward, the proportional change compared to the mean for the whole period in various categories. And you can see Category 5 hurricanes have gone completely off the scale in the last decade. So there are things appearing that, uh, that perhaps are indicative. And I want to address this from extreme value theory. Uh, I'm going to use the Weibull distribution. There's only three distributions that apply to extreme value theory. All the rest are derivatives of this. I use Weibull for two reasons. It fits to the whole profile, number one. Number two, it's been used extensively in, uh, in, in hurricane and, uh, and, 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 and high-impact weather um, studies. So it's a well-known uh, fact f feature. And, uh, and, and it, it also is the right sort of distribution for the current hurricane climate, uh, tropical cyclone climatology. The CDF for this is given by this exponential function. The PDF, which is just the differential, is given by this uh, exponential function here. And the parameters A and B, which are the tunable parameters, uh, determine essentially the scale and the shape. There's a little bit of uh, crossover in there, but, the, but A, if you think A sort of determines how it goes in this direction, and sorry, how it goes in this direction, and B is the standard deviation, you're pretty close. To show how this works, uh, this is just a few examples. I've picked this one um, here as the, uh, the solid line, solid thin line, is uh, A equals 35, B equals 1.9. This is about what current hurricane tropical cyclone climate in the, uh, in the North Atlantic um, fits to. And if I change A up to 40, you can see the spread. And the, and the change in the, um, in the amplitude. Uh, if I change um, B up to 2.3, you can see the decrease in the, uh, in the standard deviation or the shrinking down and pe more peakingness uh, aspect of the, uh, of the profile. So we can play various games with this. And this is the, um, uh, the, the, the same profile actually fitted to uh, the North Atlantic uh, tropical cyclone climatology. I've cut it off at 20. One has to do a bit of a, I can just show you the rest of it if you like, but I, I've cut it off here because in reality there's a hell of a lot of disturbances up here and I don't know how to account for them, so I've decided I'm just simply going to fit to this point up here and, uh, and then let the rest of it just sit, or, sit on the side. You can see we can fit a reasonably good, I should also say this is um, the climate with a three-point running filter applied three times because it's a very discreet result. The results are archived every five knots. So that's just had a smoothing filter placed over it as well. And on this side, this is the PDF. On this side is the CDF. And this is a characteristic of wide ball distributions that you have this uh, basically uh, straight line on a log, uh, log scale. And of course, um, basically all that's telling you is uh, what proportion of, uh, of systems are beyond a certain intensity scale. So beyond here, this proportion of systems have, uh, are going to be within that category. What we're really interested in is, uh, if we can fit the, the curve, we're actually interested in the probability of exceedance. And, uh, and, and, and basically that term there, this is the probability of exceeding a certain value C, which is going to be a, a wind speed, is 1 minus the, um, the CDF. And uh, that's given by this relationship here. We just take the 1 off. I take the, C, the, the, um, the CDF off, the, uh, off, the, off 1. Uh, and we have, this shows that if we look at the likelihood of exceeding that number, then it uh, varies uh, as C over A increases, it becomes rarer, or as B increases, it bec and the population becomes less um, variable. So basically, if you shrink the population down, your chances of exceeding a number are less, and if you, uh, if you actually um, decrease the, uh, the amplitude, the exceedance uh, capacity goes down. So let's look at a few consequences. This is applying just, just simply picking almost random numbers um, to, to just simply show the, the, the features. Here is the same curve as I showed you before. 
In this particular case, I'm going to use um, Cat5 as the number. I'll come back and look at other categories later. Uh, the probability of exceeding cat, of becoming a Cat5 is around 3% in, in this long-term climate. Okay, so if I actually just change things a little bit, uh, so I just change the parameters a little bit, and you can see the curve actually is probably a better fit up here now, but it actually extends out into here, 230% increase in Cat5. If I do a shift to the right, uh, a 220% uh, change, and if I do a bit of both, a 380% change. And I might also add that if I, uh, if I show you the means, all of the means and all of the um, uh, things that you can observe with the current observing system are below the resolution of the current observing system. Forget about whether you can find it or not. These are below the resolution of the current observing system. Let's compare a couple of periods. On the left is 1980 to 1994. On the right is 1994 to uh, 2007. I haven't got 2008 in there because this was done before I had the 2008 data. Uh, and it's interesting to just simply then do a best fit for the, uh, the Y ball to those two, and then I can back out all of the probabilities of exceedance. And it's interesting that the mean intensity change was around two to three meters a second. The standard deviation change was around four to five meters a second. This is below observational capacity. This is barely observable in the overall scheme of things. Yet that increased the probability of a Cat5 by 3.5 times. And that's the equivalent because probability in this case is, um, is roughly the same as, uh, as numbers. Uh, that's the equivalent of uh, going from one Cat5 every three years to uh, one Cat5 every year, year. And that's pretty close to what we've observed. We've actually observed more than that in the, uh, in, in, in the database. We can now do a slightly better comparison here. And what I've got on the left-hand graph is the maximum wind speed and the percentage uh, increase. And I've got all the categories listed. So cat one, two, three, four, five. And this is the Y-ball description of it. The dashed lines are plus or minus 20%, uh, which is well within the error of me fitting that curve, trust me. And, uh, and this is the actual. And you can see. Up to Cat4, it's actually pretty good. There's just a bias, and I could easily remove that by a simple change in the fit to the, uh, to the curve. But then suddenly it goes off and across to this side here for the Cat5 uh, uh, systems. And that's interesting because if I now plot the, uh, the, 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 the CDFs for these two periods, this is um, for the uh, 95 to, um, to the current. This is for the earlier period. And you can see we actually deviate over in here. Now, what happened with the, uh, the data set that I used, I, I, I did the, uh, the Lancy and the, uh, and the Emmanuel corrections to that data set before I ran these, this information. And, you know, what this is actually telling me is that we didn't do enough. The corrections, by the way, uh, reduced the intensity of a few cyclones, increased the intensity of a few others, but the net, net effect was to, to re reduce some of the intensity. This is actually saying that, if anything, we were actually over-predicting or over-analyzing um, Category 5 and possibly even Category 4 to some extent hurricanes uh, in, the, in the period 1980 to 1994. And this becomes a reasonably powerful tool because one can actually quantify these effects. Uh, it's hard to go back and say which one was right or wrong, but we can at least say whether it's consistent. Uh, the Bender et al. paper that's just uh, recently come out they predicted a mean intensity increase of uh, about, about 1%, let's say 0.71%, which equates to somewhere around 2 to 3 metres a second. Uh, and basically, they, but they, in, in addition to that, they ran the GFDL hurricane model and got a, for Cat 4 fives, they got around a 78% increase in uh, numbers. We can apply exactly the same um, extreme value theory, starting with the 1995 conditions that I've already shown you. Uh, if we then just fiddle the numbers around a bit, I couldn't be bothered going down to 2.5, but it comes to 2.8 metres a second. That gives a 35% increase in Cat5, which is not as much as this. Uh, if I add 5 metres a second in the standard deviation, and uh, I don't know if that's true or not, I get up into about the same, certainly within the same um, significance level of, uh, of the Cat4-5 increase. So basically, there's a consistency there between the modelling results and the extreme value theory. We can go to the final step and just simply go back to the original um, uh, studies that have actually said, OK, 2 to 3 metres a second per degree C. And uh, I've added 2 to 3 metres a second for standard deviation. And if you do that, 
for a two to three meter a second per, per degree C, then you end up with per degree C a 70% uh, increase in Cat 5s. And if I add this to that, I end up with a 150% increase in uh, Cat 5s. And again, I just want to emphasize both of those are actually below the resolution of the current observations. They're not even, uh, they're not even resolvable at the, at the resolution of the observing system. This is some more recent work from our own activities. And, uh, and, and, and this is where the work's going now. We're actually, I'm determined to try and explain a lot of this. And, 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 and here we have uh, some simulations at reasonably high resolution of uh, North Atlantic um, climate, hurricane climate. The observations from 1995 to 2005 are shown here. The regional climate models observations are shown here. The red show track density and the contours sitting underneath show the location, the, the, the genesis um, density. In other words, you can see the, um, the, the proportion, the high proportion of equatorial hurricanes in that, or equatorial developments in that period. You know, it turns out that the changes we've seen over the last um, uh, decade uh, between that and the previous, say, 10 or 20 years, have certainly been associated with an equatorward movement of, uh, of tropical cyclones and a, the so-called return of the equatorial hurricane and the Cape Verde uh, storms. And the model gets that reasonably well. If we go off into future climate, it actually gets more interesting because that, that movement towards equatorial development actually increases in time. And, uh, and, and, and going out to 2045 to 2055, is it real or not? Who knows? But the point here is that there is a consistent story there appearing that uh, it's not just that we've got some sort of warming up of the ocean. Uh, they're actually, at least in this modeling system, are forming in lower latitudes. They're staying over warmer water longer time. They're influenced by negative things like well, um, uh, strong wind shear and that a lot longer. And ergo, there's, a, uh, there's at least an emerging sort of uh, theoretical, emerging observational and uh, modeling reason why we should expect these results. So let me finish up by going to the summary. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday in the brief discussion, I really do think it would do us a lot of good to re-examine what we mean by an extreme hurricane. Uh, and I think in doing that, we need to start taking statistics of extreme hurricane parameters like size and translational speed and explicitly um, testing them against um, against observation, testing those predictions against observations, because without that, uh, we'll never make any improvements in this area. And I should also add in there uh, rainfall, of course, but here's, I've, just, I've, I've focused on the, on the wind field. Uh, extreme value theory predicts that there'll be a lot more uh, hurricanes, a uh, lot more extreme hurricanes than any changes in the mean or variance. And uh, this is supported by a growing amount of evidence from current, current observations and recent modeling results. And it comes back to the, uh, the, the, the hypothesis or the idea that I've been promoting for a while, and that is we should stop looking at the mean and we should start looking at the extremes because the extremes is where the signal's actually going to come out. It's not going to come out in the mean in my lifetime. I think it's already starting to come out in the extremes. Thank you.